done more than you can ever imagine in shaping the, and advancing the work and mission of President Clinton and his foundation in a relatively short period of time. Uh, as Ira will tell you in more detail, the Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS Initiative has helped save thousands of lives, thousands of lives in countries all over the world. He says he and, the, and the President Clinton started this effort three years ago. Ira works tire tirelessly and has a travel schedule that rivals President Clinton's. I am amazed that in the last 48 hours, he has traveled from Australia to Dallas, participated in a meeting there before arriving here this morning. And as you may know, he gave a wonderful lecture at noon, followed by a roundtable with the press, countless meetings uh, before joining you here this afternoon. Ira serves as chairman of the Clinton Foundation Policy Board and also as chairman of the Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS Initiative. He is also president of SJS Incorporated, a corporate, corporate st strategy consulting firm. From 1993 to 98, Ira served as senior advisor to Pre President Clinton for policy development in the White House. He supervised the development and implementation of the administration's policy for commercialization of the internet and worked with First Lady uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton on the development of the President's Health Reform Initiative. He worked extensively with the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and was a critical member of the National Domestic Policy Council. Ira was, and in the White House, and clearly is, still one of President Clinton's most important, influential, and trusted advisors. The Clinton Foundation would not be where it is today without the leadership and guidance of Ira Magazina. We here at the Foundation are truly grateful for his enormous contribution and are thrilled he took the time out of his very hectic schedule to be with us today. Thank you. <laughs> I need to take you along with me to make that to my kids. That, uh, introduction. Um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be here. Uh, what I'll do is talk to you for about 10 or 15 minutes about our work on AIDS in particular. Uh, but I'd also be happy to talk about other uh, initiatives that we have going in programs with the uh, Foundation. Uh, about three and a half years ago, President Clinton uh, and I talked about trying to uh, establish the work of the Foundation, and he was concerned about, in particular, doing something related to global to poverty reduction. And I went to see a number of uh, leaders in the world that we had worked with in the White House. and. Uh, ready to talk about education, economic development, health care, a variety of different issues. And what struck most was a number of uh, leaders that we talked to, particularly in Africa, who said, if we can't solve this AIDS crisis, it basically jeopardizes everything else we're doing. It sabotages everything else we're doing. And it's easy to see why in countries like Mozambique or Tanzania or South Africa, we have 15, 20, 30 percent of the young adults infected with HIV, which means that eventually and gradually they're going to get sick and die. Uh, it leaves in a situation uh, like the one in Mozambique where the Prime Minister told me that they have more teachers dying every year of AIDS than they can train. So talking about education policy doesn't make any sense until you do something about AIDS. In most of the hospitals there, and also now in some places in Southeast Asia, 70, 80 percent of the people in hospitals are all HIV positive. So if you're going to do something about health care, you have to do something about AIDS. And in many jobs now in South Africa and elsewhere, they hire two employees for every one they need because they reckon that one is going to get sick and die of AIDS. So it became evident that this was a problem that needed solving. But what surprised us is we said, well, aren't there a lot of groups already working in the AIDS arena? And the answer was yes, but uh, they're all working on doing general work on education and prevention, but nobody's doing care and treatment. Nobody's taking care of the people that are going to die and preventing their death. And at that time, in 2002, uh, there were six million people who needed immediate treatment for AIDS in the developing world, and only 70,000 were receiving it, slightly over 1%. Uh, most of those were uh, uh, elites in the countries who could afford to pay for themselves, and the rest of them were in kind of isolated projects that were being done by different private groups. So uh, we went to see, uh, and, and AIDS, just so you understand it, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a particularly pernicious disease. Because unlike something like Ebola or even bird flu that we're looking at now, with those other diseases, they're very deadly, but they spread very quickly. So you immediately know when you have an outbreak. And you can quarantine people, and you can get the outbreak under control in a relatively matter of weeks, and you can stop it from spreading. 
Uh, with AIDS, what's so difficult about it is it transmits as the HIV virus. And then uh, it doesn't show up in any way that you can notice for about seven or eight years, typically nine years sometimes. Uh, that is, people feel perfectly healthy. They don't know they have it. But meanwhile, all the time, they're transmitting it. And so what happens is a situation like you had in South Africa, where in 1991, less than 2% of young adults were infected. And it was mainly intravenous drug users, commercial sex workers, and people that you could say are on the margins of society. But what happened then between 1991 and 92, nobody knew it was going on. But you had a number of uh, people who would come and work in the mines part of the year. And they'd frequent the sex workers. And then they'd go back to their home communities or the truck, truckers along the truck routes. Frequent the sex workers, go back to their home communities. So that by 1998, it had spread to about 18% of the total young adults. By 2004, it was 23% of the young adults, all within the space of a little over a decade. It spread throughout the side before anybody knew that there was a real epidemic because the original people that had it didn't start getting sick until the early 2000s. And the real death rates didn't start happening until 2003, 2004. So basically what we were confronting you know, was the fact that you had 40 million people infected. It was going up to 100 million. 3 million people are dying every year. 6 million, because it typically takes about two years to die once you start getting full-blown AIDS, were needing the treatment right away, and only 70,000 were getting it. So I went to see a number of the heads of state in Europe that we work with and said, how come you all aren't doing more to deal with AIDS care and treatment? Their response was, well, our experts tell us it's too expensive. It costs about $1,600 per person per year at that time for the drugs and the tests. And in countries where the income per capita is three or $400, the public health people were saying, well, that's too expensive. We can't afford it. And the second reason they were giving is that the health infrastructure was not strong enough in these countries to actually uh, carry out effective treatment, because you can't just give people medicine. This is a complicated disease to treat. You need to monitor people. You need to work with them <coughs> and change their dosages, change the, you know, some of the drugs they're getting, uh, and evaluate side effects and treat side effects and that type of thing. And they were saying the health infrastructure doesn't exist. As we dug deeper, um, you know, uh, I basically uh, brought my findings to President Clinton and uh, said, look, I think what's going on here is that the developed world is essentially turning its back. Because as we dug deeper and I talked to more people among the experts in the bureaucracy, the subtext of a lot of what I was getting was sort of Africans die all the time, you know, and poor people in Asia die all the time, and, you know, it's expensive, and, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, President Clinton did not find that uh, an acceptable excuse. And basically what we felt was that we needed to get out front and try to do something about this. <coughs> and also what the governments were telling us is that, while well, obviously prevention is the most important thing in addition to treatment, what the governments were telling us is that the prevention uh, was impossible to do successfully without treatment. Because the key to prevention is getting people to come in and get tested, to know that they've got it. And if all you're going to be told is, you, hey, by the way, you got it, you're going to die, there's not much incentive to get tested. On the other hand, if there's treatment available for you, so you know if you get tested and identified, you can live a pretty normal life like Magic Johnson or others live, uh, it, then that's an incentive to come in and get tested, which is the most important thing for prevention. So we decided we were going to enter into this and try to provide some leadership. And we would work in two ways. One was to try to help governments that were interested to build the infrastructure in their countries to treat AIDS. And by the way, at the same time, it would also help build health infrastructure throughout the country that can deal with other diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, diarrheal diseases that are uh, common in these countries. Because until you strengthen the health infrastructure in a country, the country can't really develop itself economically. And then secondly, we decided to work on getting the cost of the drugs and the tests down. And I knew enough from my own background as a business strategist, having worked in the industry and many industries over a couple of decades, that the cost of the drugs was much less to produce than was being charged. Uh, and uh, I suspected that the reasons were because the volumes were too small. And so what we had to do was try to get the volumes up and then work to get the cost down. So to make a long story short, we, uh, uh, at the AIDS conference, the International AIDS Conference that's held every two years, the one in 2002 was in Barcelona, President Clinton and Mas uh, President Mandela uh, closed the conference with speeches. President Clinton announced to people that he was going to do more than talk about the problem. He was going to get involved. 
And in a typical President Clinton fashion, he sort of said, okay, I accept your recommendation on what we should do, now I want you to lead it. And uh, so I agreed to sign on and volunteer. Um, for what I thought might be a year or two, has now been three and a half years so far I've been volunteering uh, to kind of get this thing moving. Now, the long and short of it is where we are now. Uh, we started out in three countries, but now we're in 21, where we are directly providing uh, technical assistance to the governments to design detailed business plans on how to scale up care and treatment for AIDS, and we're helping them implement it. There are about nine or ten different things you got to do to have a successful AIDS program, ranging from you know training the doctors and the nurses to helping uh, set up the right drug procurement and logistics system to helping set up the laboratories and upgrade the laboratory testing to helping set up the voluntary counseling and testing centers where people can get tested and so on and so forth. And so we've developed partners who have expertise in all these different areas. And we're helping now in 21 countries. In Africa, the countries we're working in have about half all the AIDS cases in Africa, so it's a significant portion. In Asia, they have about 85% uh, of all the AIDS cases in Asia. And uh, in the Caribbean, where we're working, it's about 95% of all the AIDS cases. So we're working in places with significant proportions of the people involved. <coughs> And those programs are now scaling up, and I'll come back and talk about the numbers later. <coughs> um, and the other thing we started doing was to work with the drug and testing companies to try to lower the prices. And without going into too much detail, basically what we did is we first approached the uh, uh, R&D companies that developed the drugs in the United States and Europe to work with us. Uh, they would not do so. Uh, they basically wanted to provide their prices. Um, they were cheaper than what they charged in the U.S., but they were still too expensive. <coughs> so we then went to um, uh, some drug companies in India and South Africa that have been <coughs> pre-qualified by the World Health Organization as producing high-quality drugs, and even the U.S. FDA had certified their factories as being of good quality. And we started working with them, and essentially we said to them, uh, look, right now you're selling uh, very small quantities of these AIDS drugs. The orders that come in are very small volume. They're very intermittent. As it turned out, about 30% of the times they never even got paid because the governments or small NGOs that were ordering the drugs wound up reneging on paying them. And so it was very high cost for them to produce it. What we said was, look, we're going to be working in a number of countries on treatment programs. We're going to have too many people in treatment by 2008. So what we want to talk about is how you can scale up your production and get more efficient because you're going to have bigger scale production continuous production. Forecast with you, we're going to send some of our experts in to work with you on how the costs will come down as we do that. And we want you to forward price to those costs so that we can set the whole wheel in motion here. Because the idea is it's almost like what you know, Henry Ford did with the Model T car, right? He said, if I can produce a car that's cheap enough, a lot of people will buy it. And that will let me have enough volume that makes sure the car is cheap enough. But something's got to jump start that. So we said, we'll be the ones to jumpstart that. We'll organize the buyers. We'll work with the producers on what they can do to get their costs down, assuming the volumes. We'll tell them the volumes are coming. And then we also went back all the way in the raw material chain, because a lot of the raw materials are raw chemicals that come from China and Korea and so on. So we went all the way back to the raw material suppliers and did the same thing with them. So we could say to the final drug people, we're going to get you cheaper prices on your raw materials as well. And we put this all together. And the net effect is that we were able to uh, bring the price of the drugs down to under $140 per person per year. And then once the uh, R&D testing companies saw we had done that, the U.S. and European companies then said they would play with us because they didn't want us putting Indian and Chinese companies in competition with them. And so we signed deals uh, four months later in the beginning of uh, 2004 with the major testing companies. And uh, the total result is that we can now treat people entirely for about $160 per person per year instead of what was $1,600. And what that did is it completely changed the economics so that now donor money could uh, go much further. And we effectively took away the excuse from the donors, saying, OK, now it's cheaper. So you got no excuse. we got to save these lives. So where we are today now <clears throat> is that there are over 52 countries, or 52 we just signed Pakistan as the 52nd country that can take advantage of our drug, low price drugs and tests. Uh, we have to make sure that a country has payment mechanisms so that our partner companies get paid. We have to make sure there's enough security so that the drugs don't get diverted to some warlord who takes them to Europe and profiteers with them. 
uh, but assuming they can meet certain basic requirements, we and, and that there's an honest tender process, so that our companies don't get asked to pay a lot of bribes to people. And then uh, we now have these 21 countries where we're directly on the ground, uh, working on helping them scale up their care and treatment and setting models for the world and how to do it. Now at the AIDS conference, in, uh, which was held in Bangkok, Thailand last year, we had gotten this moving and others had started following us, but there were two groups that were being left behind. One was children, because children were harder to treat and the children's drugs are different. They're liquids and so on that have to be prepared differently. And the second was people who lived in rural areas because there was basically very little health infrastructure, very few doctors and so on in rural areas. And yet 70% of the people in India, China, and Africa live in rural areas. So we decided last year, again, to try to be ahead of the curve and be leaders and to move ahead on developing programs for children in rural areas. With children, it was particularly uh, pitiful because there were 500,000 children who died of AIDS in the world that year. And outside of Brazil and Thailand that had programs, there were only 10,000 kids on treat. So we committed, we again did the same deal and got the price of the drugs down from 600 to about 200 for the children. And we committed in this case ourselves, to buying drugs for 10,000 kids and starting up programs in 10 countries to treat those kids. This year we're going to quintuple that to 50 or 60,000 kids. And now UNICEF and some of these other organizations who should have been doing this in the first place are now coming on board and doing it. And so, again, we're trying to be catalysts to provide the leadership and we've gotten moving now on getting kids in treatment. And then we've also now are establishing models in rural areas based on the work of a man named Paul Farmer in Haiti, who was one of our partners. Uh, there's a book called Mountains Beyond Mountains uh, by Tracy Kidder written about his work. Uh, we partnered with Paul early on in Haiti, and now we've brought him to Africa, to the poorest parts of Rwanda, to work with us. And he uses a, a model of rural health care <coughs> based around uh, community health workers from each village that are trained, uh, that do kind of rudimentary tasks of observing people take their pills, of trying to um, know simple things about, you know, being able to observe when kids' malnutrition is going to become serious or when there are waterborne diseases or side effects to the AIDS or whatever, and can then alert a series of nurses who staff health clinics in villages nearby, leading up to a district hospital in a central area where you can have a doctor. Uh, and then it's a way to run a low resource-based but still effective healthcare system in a rural area. So we're now <coughs> pioneering models uh, in Rwanda, Tanzania, Mozambique, Kenya, Lesotho, and Ethiopia of rural care. And we're soon, under a, an additional initiative of the foundation, going to be expanding that to clean water and sanitation and to uh, agricultural development uh, to provide uh, food security in those rural areas. Again, we'll start in three countries to sort of model what can be done. And then we'll extend to other countries, but then others can copy us in what we're doing and we hopefully can make a dent on that problem the same way as we are on AIDS. So bottom line right now is that <coughs> um, the world has moved from 70,000 to slightly over a million on treatment. Um, and uh, there are 250,000 uh, directly uh, benefiting from our work. That number is going to go up very rapidly now. Um, and uh, we will meet our goal of having 2,000, uh, sorry, 2 million people by 2008. Because the way this works is that you know, we had to spend a good amount of time building out the infrastructure to be ready for the treatment before we could really start getting the numbers up. But now we've done a lot of that in a lot of countries. And so the numbers are increasing very rapidly in the countries we're in. So the numbers are going to scale up uh, very quickly uh, now. <coughs> and uh, uh, we hope, I think, if uh, we can keep the same resolve we have, that um, uh, we're going to break the back of this disease uh, in the next three to five years in the world. And in the process, we'll also strengthen the health infrastructures overall the developing world. I'll finish uh, my comments on this with just uh, uh, something that's personally meant a lot to me, uh, <coughs> but which characterizes our work every day. Um, and that is that uh, you will never be involved in something if you become involved in this, or we we never be. I've never been involved in something. But more directly, what you do either saves people's lives or lets them die. It's, it's breathtaking um, how that works. Um, and it came home to me when I was first just beginning this, the first week, literally, that we were doing the first two weeks. <clears throat> I went to the Bahamas, which has a small country but has the second highest incidence of AIDS in the Caribbean. 
And I went to the hospital there, to AIDS patients. The hospital was completely overcrowded. There were two or three people to a bed. There was this young, loving old boy and 10-year-old girl sharing the same bed. Uh, the boy had just had a stroke. Um, and the doctor said basically they had a couple of weeks to live. Um, and the same was true almost every bed I visited and talked to people. We managed to get drugs in there the next week and send down some of our experts and get the program going there right away. Three months later, President Clinton came to the Bahamas and he um, made a speech. And this boy and girl were both back in school. They were both uh, healthy, they were getting treatment. And they came up to the stage all dressed up, gave him flowers. He's been back each year to the Bahamas just recently, a couple of weeks ago, and met them again. He meets them every time he comes. And they're flourishing. And they would have been dead, uh, except for our direct actions. The week after I was in the Bahamas that first trip, I went to Rwanda where we were going to start off the program. I visited a number of clinics, same thing, number of hospitals, multiple people to the beds, and so on. And it took us a couple of months to get the program going there. And when we finally got it going, I realized that everybody I'd met on that first trip was dead. Uh, everybody, that there was a whole other crop of people who had occupied those same beds who were dead uh, because we moved slower. We couldn't move any faster. And so what I've inculcated into all our people is two things. One is every day we move faster, we save lives. Every day we move slower, people die. And one of the terrible things about the way the development world works these days is the painfully slow pace at which they move. Uh, and so we have made it a hallmark of ours to move quickly and to try to get the political systems that we work with to move as quickly as possible to save as many lives as possible. And uh, the second thing that um, you know was inculcated to me in this is that we have to have a great um, uh, humility about what we're doing because we're seeing death all around us but that it's very important for everybody who works with us to get to know some of the people, some of the families, and some of the patients, and to become friends, because it brings home to you what you're doing. And as I said earlier, you'll never have an opportunity in your life to make that direct a difference by your own individual actions on what happens with uh, people's lives. And um, uh, as President Clinton, um, more eloquently than I could do, said, I think it was on a Nightline interview, when he was talking about the AIDS work in the interview, he said, well, you seem pretty passionate about this work. And he had, uh, I think, just gotten back from China where we had been treating kids and so on. And he had met a number of the kids that we were treating and their parents. And he said, you know, when you look into the eyes of a child whose life you've saved, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, and I think that's um, uh, the way we feel about this, uh, this work that we're doing. President Clinton often talks, talks about the importance of our common humanity. And essentially, these are our fellow human beings who, uh, for want of uh, anything other than where they were born and the circumstances of their lives, could be us. Um, and we have a responsibility to try to ensure that uh, their lives can uh, be as fruitful as, uh, as we want to try to make uh, our lives. And that's what uh, I think guides our foundation's efforts more than anything. The other thing that we uh, use as a guidepost are two other things. One is that we work always with political leaderships in countries. As an NGO, which is what we are, a non-governmental organization or a private foundation, a lot of NGOs go into a country and they'll set up their own clinic, let's say. And they do that because they can control it and move fast and get something done. Uh, they do something which I don't like, which is often they'll hire some of the best people away from the government, double their salaries, and have them come work with their clinic, which weakens the capacity of the mainstream system in the country to be able to, to do its job. Uh, we won't do that. But our approach is different than that, because even though that clinic can help 100 people or 50 people, we want to help millions of people. And you can't scale something up unless you're working through the mainstream institutions in the country, unless you strengthen the capacity of those institutions uh, to do their jobs. And one of the things that President Clinton always says, which is absolutely true, is that intelligence is evenly distributed across the globe. What's well, not distributed as evenly is opportunity. You know, I've been in the remotest villages in China, India, Africa that you can imagine, and met and talked to people and worked with people who are helping organize the clinics there and so on. And a lot of the people I meet in those villages, if they had been born in Silicon Valley, could be Bill Gates. You know, the very smart, entrepreneurial, bright people who just haven't had the opportunity or the education or 
somebody to train them in, in how to organize things. So this is all something that's doable, and we're now extending our work into water and sanitation agriculture, as I said. And uh, we're committed to um, uh, trying to reduce global poverty in this way. We also have started the domestic initiative. I won't go into it in detail because I want to get into a discussion with you all and not just talk the whole time on childhood obesity and trying to do something about uh, healthier lifestyles for our children because uh, not my children, my children are somewhat grown now, but I would say your children, looking around the room, are going to be the first uh, generation of American children in the history of the Republic to live less long lives than their parents. And the main reason is because of the crap that they're eating and the fact that they're not getting enough exercise. And so President Clinton is going to, uh, has partnered with the American Health, uh, Heart Association on a major initiative which we're now rolling out to try to deal with that issue. And then we're also investigating um, the issue of climate change and trying to uh, conceive of a way, much as we've done with AIDS and health where we can, global health, where we can intervene in the climate change uh, uh, catastrophe that's going to be upon us and try to see if we can help uh, make a decision there. Uh, let me finish by just saying that um, uh, for me, the motivation, and this is very clear, uh, President Clinton um, has a standing in the world that's unique, truly unique. I mean, Nelson Mandela uh, certainly has uh, a reputation and stature of President Clinton, uh, but he's more advanced in years, and his ability to uh, affect change in an energetic way is now somewhat limited, except by the example of uh, his greatness in the past. And that leaves President Clinton uniquely in the world. Number one, he's known everywhere. Uh, I've been in villages in China where I'm the first uh, white person they've ever seen, uh, but they know who President Clinton is. And when they hear that we're associated with him, they ask about his health, or they, you know, they've seen something on the news about him in, in China. Um, and he has an enormous affection and enormous respect uh, among uh, government leaders, business leaders everywhere globally, uh, which is uh, almost untarnished. Um, and you know the political uh, trivies in the United States that go on in our partisan system and so on, and the things that went on um, uh, to and fro in the administration uh, don't penetrate abroad. So globally, uh, what they know of President Clinton uh, is, is a, a great man who really cares about poor people in the world, really cares about the vulnerable, really uh, cares about global issues, is not a uh, you know, a Western imperialist in uh, the sense, you know, not a somebody who's uh, coming in to, uh, uh, in a classic sense, be a colonialist or try to, you know, lecture people on what to do, but somebody who really cares about people. Uh, you know, you go to the Caribbean and just like sometimes in the United States, he's referred to as uh, you know, the first African-American president. Uh, people in Africa or in the Caribbean or in Asia will talk about him as the first Asian president or the first, you know, president who cared about Africa or the first president who cared about the Caribbean. And so it gives us a tremendous opportunity uh, to do something significant in the world because of that trust. And so our job is to come in and, you know, utilizing as little of his time as possible because his time is so limited, to try to build organizationally and strategically efforts that can build upon who he is and get something done with it. Because it, it doesn't utilize his ability to affect good in the world just to have him go make speeches. I mean, he can make great speeches that can inspire people. But being able to follow it up with actual concrete work that makes a difference can really extend his reach. And for those like me who are you know, working on this, uh, what we feel is we share his values and what he wants to accomplish. And I can get a lot more done working under his banner that I can do off on my own. You know, I mean, maybe I could get, certainly would probably work less hard, but. I could, I could um, you know, get more of the glory or more of the whatever if I'm off of my own, but I'd get 10% done or 5% of what I can get done working for him. And so all our people who work on this feel that way. And as a result, we can attract the best people and we can uh, actually get things done. So that's really what we're trying to do with the uh, program piece of the foundation. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we're hoping that some of you will join us and uh, uh, work with us. Let me stop there, and I can just take uh, questions or comments that you might have. Yes, sir. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Magazine. Yeah. My name is Malcolm Glover. I'm from Bowie, Maryland, and I'm a student here at the Clinton School. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of the problems you might have had early on on the ground 
Um, you say you started off, what was it, with two countries? We started in, um, in Africa, in Mozambique, Rwanda, and then we started in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Yep. And have there ever been, um, whether it's uh, with different government agencies or health organizations, what were some of those problems? Um, I know that recently there have been a couple of articles um, in terms of uh, different faith-based groups who don't allow uh, uh, certain treatments. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, the, the most the biggest and most substantive problems are simply ones of organization and management um, and trying to um, uh, help um, get things organized in countries that have not had a long history of management and organization uh, in the way that we might have had in, in this country. Um, and. Uh, I think that's one thing we have to overcome. The second thing is there is a deep and, I would say, justifiable suspicion on the part of most people in Africa and Asia uh, and the Caribbean about white Westerners coming in and telling them what to do because of the colonial history. and. A lot of donors, governments, and donor agencies, frankly, don't keep their promises. So they'll come in and they'll say, we're going to do X, and they'll hold press releases, and they'll you know, do things like that. And then they don't deliver. And they make excuses about you know, the local government being corrupt, or the local government being uh, inept, and not having the capacity, and so on. And, uh, and in fact, a lot of it is just that the donors are, are worried about protecting their own rear ends, and so they're afraid to, to do anything. And, and they don't trust the people they're working with locally. They don't respect them, and that comes through. And so we had to overcome an initial distrust. Yes, they like President Clinton, they trust President Clinton, but you know these guys that he's sending, are they really going to work with us in a respectful way? And so we had to overcome that, and I think I'm glad to say that we've done so, and we're now trusted advisors, and we often have our people sitting in the government ministries and so on actually working as extensions of their their staffs. So that was a problem. Thirdly, there were occasionally, as in any political system, as there are in Washington, people who are corrupt or people who are doing things for the wrong reasons in government. Now, we have a unique position because of the political will we can generate with President Clinton that when I go into a country, you know, if I talk to a president of a country and say, look, we, we, we'll accept your invitation, because we only come if the government invites us, that we'll accept your invitation. But one of the things is we've got to run an honest shop here. And so if I've got some governor or some minister then who's trying to hold us up for something or being too bureaucratic or not, you know, I'll just get on the phone to the president of the country or, you know, and say, look, this wasn't the deal we had. And we can clear things away in a way that most NGOs can't. So uh, we can do that. And um, uh, so we can overcome those problems. Of the sort you're talking about, um, we do work with other NGOs. And, and I would say, by and large, most faith-based organizations that we work with, that I've seen, are doing tremendous work. And uh, you know, there are many uh, Catholic uh, groups of Catholic nuns and so on working in these countries, just doing wonderful work. Uh, occasionally, you do get some of the religious groups who um, will do things like, you know, yeah, you can have your medicine, but only if you come to church, only if you do this, only you know, in ways that. Um, uh, are less than appropriate, I think. But I'd say the vast majority are, are doing good work and uh, will often uh, partner with them. Um, so, you know, the obstacles, I would say, are more often ones from the donor side than they are from the uh, in-country side. Uh, the other obstacles are the natural ones you expect. You know, our people will occasionally get sick. Our people will, you know, we're working in tough circumstances sometimes. Um, it's uh, logistically more difficult to get stuff done than it is, you know, power outages happen all the time, that kind of stuff, the problems of poverty that you have around you. But if you're determined enough and your motivation is clear, you can, you can succeed and get around those things. And I think we've, we've been able to do that. I'm um, Nate Smith. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I work in um, doing a heavy care in rural Africa. Where were you? In Kenya. Where, which part of Kenya? And, uh, a hospital called Kijabi Hospital, which is about, about 50 kilometers northwest of Nairobi. Okay. So yep. And the time I was working, 
working with before a lot of these things have been and I'm just really, I'm so happy with what's happened and how it's transformed the, the whole scenario. Um, I was interested in, in your thoughts and ideas on long-term sustainability. Um, I, you know, I think of some of the malaria eradication right. efforts of previous generations and right. how we can do things different. Yes, this is a very important question and one we've given a lot of thought to. Questions of sustainability and scalability are very important. And the first key on sustainability is to uh, work through the mainstream systems in the country instead of setting up private NGO-only kind of activities because those are not ultimately sustainable. They depend upon foreign money. They don't have a, an embedded structure. Uh, and so strengthening the governmental institutions and some of the other mainstream private institutions in the country is crucial. The second thing is to uh, get the affordability equation in line, which we've been working on doing, and we're going to continue to drive down the price of drugs and treatment further. The third is, is training, uh, so that ultimately we make ourselves superfluous, ourselves as foreigners, uh, and that we uh, basically, uh, in all our activities, are training not just the doctors and nurses and the community health workers, but also the managers and so on. So in many of our countries, uh, including in Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, a lot of our programs are management training programs for healthcare professionals who are working in the rural areas, working in, the, in uh, uh, some of the administrative positions so that the skill sets gets transferred and, and that can help with the sustainability. The final piece is that there is a requirement for funding ultimately. And um, we need, particularly with AIDS, a disease where it's not likely to be a cure for at least 10 or 15 years to ensure the sustainability of the outside financing that's necessary. There's a conference I'm going to in Paris about uh, something that the French government has proposed that is an interesting solution, which is to put a small tax on airline tickets um, around the world, which would go uh, to AIDS care and treatment and be sustainable as a sort of revenue source. And if you think about it, I mean, most airline tickets come from business travelers and you know people with some degree of money, certainly on a global scale, anybody who can afford to fly. Uh, and so the idea of taking a small piece of that, and it would be a matter of, you know, 50 cents a ticket or something, or, I mean, uh, or even less, um, as a way to keep AIDS care and treatment sustainable is a pretty interesting idea. So we're looking for mechanisms like that that can make it sustainable. But those are the things that have often been uh, not present in, in former efforts, and uh, we're trying to build those into the programs that, we, um, that we're working on with the governments. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Well, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the first opportunity that students here at the Clinton School would have to become directly involved in the programs that you're talking about, the Clinton Foundation will be the internship, right. that there are international internships that they will all be required to do this right. summer. And uh, one thing that interested me is uh, the, what I wonder if you had any comment uh, uh, that, uh, about that. Yeah. I also thought that uh, perhaps to have you review the remarks you made lunch about the conditions under which anyone working with the foundation would need to be prepared for. Well, uh, the answer to the first question is simple. We welcome you. Um, we um, we uh, have had interns working with us. Um, and uh, although I, I gather your three-month internships are, are short, but we still can have uh, useful projects that you can do with us over those three months, and we'd welcome to, to have you, and we can deploy you in, you know, uh, certainly any one of 21 countries we're in, uh, depending upon where we have the need, and perhaps more. Um, and uh, then we'd welcome you after you graduate. Uh, we need good people. Um, and uh, to the second question, um, one of the things we wanted to do here as a matter of um, um, I would say almost moral principle, but also effectiveness, is that um, you know we're doing this in part because for economic, social, really international uh, security issues, this is important. You know, you look at uh, these children armies and these children terrorists that are being recruited. They're mainly AIDS orphans. You know, kids that have nowhere to go, and, and these armies take them in and feed them and give them guns and, you know, become their first family. And, and if some of them are HIV positive, they basically, uh, 
you know, uh, get them to become suicide bombers. I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. But, uh, but we also are doing this for moral reasons uh, because, as President Clinton said at that AIDS conference in 2002, you know, somebody 50 years or 100 years from now judging our generation, if we let 100 million people die uh, when we had the wherewithal to save their lives, uh, you know, uh, we deserve a harsh judgment from history and uh, we can't let that happen. So on that basis, we also formed our work in saying that one of the things that is least commendable about a lot of development work is that, uh, uh, in the case of USAID, 60 or 70 percent of the money never leaves the country. That gets appropriated by Congress. And the salaries and other things that are paid are, are uh, at least by comparison, uh, fairly high. So we basically uh, decided to set ourselves up in a very low-cost way where as much of our money as possible is going directly into the countries, directly into programs. And what that's meant is that um, we have very, very low overhead to what we do. We employ a lot of volunteers. Most. Um, but also what we say to our people is something different. I mean, I, I uh, jokingly created a slide that I go over with everybody that we're going to look to hire uh, or to bring on as a volunteer. And I say, look, uh, first of all, you can make more money doing anything else, even in development. If you work for USAID, our salaries are a third to a fourth of what USAID pays, proudly, a third to a fourth of what USAID pays. And a lot of the you know, donor groups in these countries, a lot of the NGOs, you know, they're living in big houses with uh, cars and drivers and you know, SUVs and you know, all kinds of uh, trips back to the States and so on. Uh, they fly business class. We don't do that. We fly discount coach. They stay in, you know, big hotels, and we don't do that. We stay in cheaper, small, but safe hotels. Um, so I say, you know, you're going to make much less. You're going to not get any frills or any perks here. You're going to work far harder than you've done in any job in your life. Uh, you're going to work in very difficult conditions. Uh, you're likely to get sick during the course of, you know, you work here a number of times. Um, you're going to see death around you. You're going to um, uh, and, uh, be working for a boss who doesn't tolerate failure and doesn't have much of a sense of humor. Uh, and basically, you know, uh, that's the conditions under which you're going to be working if you come here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and you're going to burn yourself out. This is going to be this is a burnout job. Okay, unless you've got a tremendous tolerance for hard work. You know, after three, four, five years of this, you're going to burn yourself out. So this is not a place you're going to come and build a career, likely. Now, you're welcome to, but not likely. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said earlier, uh, you're going to be effective. We're going to get stuff done. And uh, you know, you're going to be able to, for the rest of your life, look back and know that you were part of something that made a huge difference in the world. There are going to be thousands of people alive just because of your activities that wouldn't have been alive, and so on. So there's, that's, that's what you're doing this for, not for the rest of it. Not for a career, not for money. And I say that you know, your happiness or your welfare as, a, as somebody working for us is not my first concern. It's not my second concern. It's not even my third concern. And my first concern is the patients and how many we can save, how many lives we're going to save. My second concern is their families and are we supporting their families. And my third concern is are we strengthening the governments and the other uh, mainstream institutions in the country, and you come a distant fourth, whether you're happy or not in any given day, doesn't matter to me. Now, all things being equal, I want you to be satisfied in your job, but that's far down the list. You know, your satisfaction will come five years from now from the fact that you did something good, and you can look back on it and tell your children about it and so on. So uh, that may now deter some of you from volunteering with us, but, um, but uh, that's the way we run ourselves. And I think part of what we're trying to do is not, you know, be critical of others, but we are trying to set a different standard of the way development ought to work in the world. I mean, you know, business class airfares cost four times as much as coach airfares, or three times as much. And even for a 16-hour flight, I mean, you know, come on, you can live, you know, you can you can live sitting back there and coach. It ain't so bad. And if you're tired enough, you'll sleep anywhere. You sleep standing up. So, and so, you know, we'll let people use their points that they accumulate if occasionally they want to fly business class uh, to you know, buy a cheap coach ticket and then upgrade it with points because they want to sleep going into a meeting or something. But we won't ever pay for anything beyond the discount coach fare. 
and uh, and I do that so that nobody else can complain and everybody else does it and uh, and we save a couple of million dollars a year that goes directly into drugs for kids you know that's the that's the trade-off and so you know we can we can save a kid's life for three hundred dollars and so every three hundred dollars we save is a big deal for us and we want to put it directly towards those kids lives so that's the way we run yes Yes, um, um, one of the things I can say that is very painful, you know, having been around the world in I don't know how many countries in the past three and a half years, is that I think America's standing in the world right now is at the lowest I've ever seen it, even far lower than during the Vietnam War, you know, far lower. And uh, that's a tragic thing, um, you know, and, and uh, even in many European countries, even in a place like Ireland or, you know, which is a where people are very friendly to Americans, you know, very positive. Their view of America right now is very negative, and they, they view America and American government policy as being a greater uh, cause of uh, uh, instability in the world and, uh, and um, uh, a greater contributor to war in the world than, than they do the terrorists. I mean, it's, it's terrible. And so that's a reality we're living with right now, and, and frankly, I think you know, when I travel around with President Clinton, um, part of what happens when he comes to a country, and, and the way it's, it's almost enhanced the love that people have for him, uh, which was already there, is that you know, he's a symbol of an American, who, an American president who they feel cared about them, cares about them, and, and who is more humane in his approach and more tolerant in his approach and so on. So that is a backdrop that we work against, and it's a serious um, problem. Um, President Clinton has had an interest that we reach out and work in areas of the world where it's where these conflicts are greatest uh, as much as we can um, in order to try to overcome. So you know, we uh, we were in Pakistan last week, which is uh, and just as there were literally tens of thousands of people in the streets protesting like, about these, this Muslim cartoon issue and so on. Um, we were signing an agreement with the government to give them access to all low-priced drugs and tests, raids, and the Prime Minister and so on was up there signing with us, and President Clinton was able to offer a message of uh, greater tolerance and sort of understanding to people, and there was a, a tremendous positive press in the Pakistani press and so on about President Clinton and the Foundation's efforts. We, um, one of the first places we are going to bring to universal coverage in Africa is a, an island called Zanzibar off the coast of Tanzania, which is 98-99% uh, Muslim, and is kind of a famous um, place in Muslim history as, because it was a major trading uh, port between Africa and the Middle East, uh, going back for a thousand years. And uh, and so President Clinton went to Zanzibar, and we you know got universal coverage there, and we uh, it was covered all over the Muslim world that we were giving special attention to a Muslim place and trying to uh, work. So we're trying to do what we can to bridge those gaps. And um, uh, in places like Tanzania, Tanzania is 50% Muslim overall. Uh, Kenya has a substantial Muslim population. And we're always working with those populations, including the religious leaders, as well as uh, mainstream. So we're doing the best we can to overcome some of that negative feeling. I think also on something like the climate change issue where America has kind of gone against the rest of the world and we haven't endorsed the Kyoto Treaty and we're viewed as not, you know, we're responsible for spewing off by far the largest amount of greenhouse gases of anybody in the world. And, you know, President Clinton went to Montreal to the Global Conference on Climate Change and made a speech and tried to speak in important ways about what needs to be done. So we're doing the best we can to try to um, uh, foster better harmony. I, I've got to say also, and I'm sorry to talk for so long, but these things keep coming to my mind. It's what happens when you're too tired. You talk too much. But, but the, um, uh, you know, in China and India, it's very interesting because <coughs> we went there uh, in 2003 the first time, and many people were saying those governments were in denial about AIDS. 
President Clinton went and, say, in China, he spoke at the first public AIDS conference ever held in China, brought a young man with AIDS up to the stage and embraced him on Chinese television. We went to see President Hu Jintao and former President Jiang Zemin. They wanted to talk to President Clinton about trade and North Korea and so on, which we did. And then he said, look, I'd like to talk to you about something, and we talked about the AIDS issue. And, you know, within a few weeks, President Hu was out visiting an AIDS clinic. And within a few months, we had signed an agreement, the first time ever a Chinese government signed an agreement with a private foundation on a partnership. And we now have our people working within the Chinese Ministry of Health, and we have over 20 people working throughout the country helping scale up treatment there. Similar in India, the first time they've ever signed an agreement with a private foundation. And so we've been able to work in a way which, um, uh, leveraging off of President Clinton's respect, that is helping to try to build understanding. And one of the things I'm most proud of is um, President Kagame in Rwanda made a comment uh, which has been echoed by others to President Clinton when he saw him privately about six months ago saying, you know, we really like working with the Clinton Foundation because they work in a collegial way with us, which is not common among, you know, the Westerners we work with and the Dumbers we work with. And so that let me know that we were doing our job right. Anyway, sorry. So, I'm Right. Yeah. Um, saying that we're organized may be generous to us. We, we, we've we grown this thing very rapidly over a couple of years. Um, and so, like a, a startup company, um, we're always on the edge of chaos um, as we as we grow so fast because we're, we're adding so many people and because a lot of our people are volunteers and so on, we have people coming in. Now. But typically what we do is we, we have... Um, um, uh, country directors in each country. So when we come into a country, if we're going to be involved with technical assistance, as we're now doing in 21 countries, we'll come in with a team to meet with the government. Uh, it's always at the invitation of the government. We have, you know, probably another 10, 15 governments that have invited us to come in that we just can't respond because we can't grow that fast. But so we're always responding to an invitation. We come meet with the government. We say to them, look, the way we work is that we respond to your priorities. So why don't you talk to us about what you're doing, how you think we can be helpful, and so on. Then depending upon what, the, and that immediately casts us in a different way. Then we talk to them about what their priorities are, what their problems are, and typically uh, we define out then a work program about what we can do to help. And typically they want us to help with management of things as well as helping with individual pieces of the puzzle uh, of what needs to be done. And we'll sort of draw up a general MOU. Uh, we don't come with large amounts of money ourselves, although we have government donor partners that will contribute money government to government in support of the programs we help the government develop. But we do come with small amounts of money, and it's flexible money, uh, which is very valuable, and it's money that can move quickly. Uh, you know, typical donor stuff requires, like in India, DFID, which is the British development agency equivalent to USAID, it took two and a half years to negotiate their agreement of how they were going to work in India on AIDS. Uh, two and a half years. It took us two weeks, and we had a team in there. So we typically move very quickly, very flexibly, and we work based on trust. So typically what other donors will do is they want the government to uh, work with their consultants to come up with all these detailed plans and all these detailed sort of uh, audit requirements and so on and so about how they're going to do stuff and how they're going to phase it and what the audit's going to be, what the sort of, we basically define a program quickly and then we say, look, we're going to trust you until you prove to us you can't be trusted. And so, you know, if, we, if we're going to put in a couple hundred thousand dollars to let the government hire some people initially or a couple million dollars to set up a program and we transfer that money to the government, uh, we do it. And we just say, look, give us your normal reporting. We don't want any special reporting here. And our people are typically working very intimately with the program, so we'd probably get a sense if something was going wrong. Uh, we would get a sense. But we basically operate on, based on trust. And not once in three and a half years has any government violated that trust where uh, anything untoward was done. And that establishes a whole different atmosphere to the relationship and one where there's really a lot of... Uh, easy working and respect and so on. So we essentially set that in motion with the agreements. President Clinton may come and sign the MOU if he's going to be 
ground, if not, I'll sign it or whatever. And then we deploy a, a team on the ground, and the team starts working, and it all happens very quickly. And um, uh, because, as I said earlier, every day we move faster, we save lives every day, we move slower, people die, so we want to move quickly. On the drug and testing agreements, we have, uh, and so the way we're organized is we now have country managers in each country. I have a COO who supervises the country managers. We have you know, a couple of areas. I've got somebody responsible for Southeast Asia, you know, somebody in Africa and so on. But we're very low overhead, so the person responsible is actually also in charge of a country, in charge of a region. And then we have a separate group that what we call our services, which is the people who do our drug and test agreements, people who do our laboratory uh, services, a group now that's our care consortium. Uh, we're uh, setting up now real-time feedback mechanisms among all the countries to evaluate what works, what doesn't work, so that we can get rapid feedback um, and set up a kind of quality system to improve quality overall in the treatment. So those are all on a separate unit where, which are centralized in the sense that uh, we have people with those expertise and then the country managers will call on the expertise. So if I go into Ethiopia, they need help with the upgrading of their labs, we can deploy people from our lab team in to help train local lab people and uh, do that. Or if uh, we are going to do something on the drugs, we have you know, a drug procurement team, we can come and help them set up a logistic system or a procurement system or whatever. And um, and then we have a group that's part of the drug team that's, uh, and lab team that are negotiating new deals to get the price of other drugs reduced, to get the price of other tests reduced, that type of thing. So that's why we're organized. But it's, um, it's, it's always a work in progress. And uh, if you go across our emails, I mean, there's always, every week, you know, 10 new people that just come on board or 20 new people introducing themselves to everybody and, uh, because we're growing so fast. Export our healthcare system anywhere. I think um, <laughs> that's a whole separate topic. But um, I think um, um, you know the way we finance our healthcare system in this country um, uh, is um, wasting a tremendous amount of money, and also is um, uh, diminishing the, the quality of the healthcare in this country dramatically that the average person receives. If you're very wealthy in America, you can receive the best care in the world. Uh, if you're very wealthy anywhere else, you can come to America and receive the best care in the world. But for average people, you know, the health outcomes in this country are a scandal. We are the only developed country in the world that does not have universal health coverage. Uh, there are now 25 developing countries that have universal health coverage. And yet in this country, if you try to propose that, you're called utopian or socialist or whatever. Uh, and we now spend over 30, between 30 and 35 percent of our health care dollar on administrative costs that don't improve the health care of anybody and arguably in many cases hurt the health care of people by delaying appropriate care. You don't find that elsewhere in the world either. Uh, and so as a result, you know, the wealthiest country in the world, uh, albeit if a lot of it is borrowed wealth, uh, a lot of our wealth, uh, uh, despite all that, um, you know, our infant mortality rates and a lot of our other health care indicators are you know, number 20, number 30, number 40 in the world. And so that's a, that's a scandal in itself. I think what we're doing more is we're taking the fact that we have had to deal with AIDS um, in this country or have dealt with it sooner because the epidemic came here sooner in many ways than most parts of the world. And so we built up expertise um, in dealing with AIDS, dealing with other infectious diseases that can be useful elsewhere. And so we are taking some of that expertise abroad. Um, but it's not a question of importing our system elsewhere or exporting our system elsewhere. It's more some of our experts 
Um, and um, I think um, you know, the American healthcare system is uh, severely broken and it needs fixing. But we tried that and didn't succeed, so uh, hopefully somebody will try again soon. Definitely, uh, and, and I think for now, because we're dealing with an emergency, what we'll often do like with our rural programs is, you know, the community health workers that we bring on, and so we may give bicycles to them, or we may um, uh, find other modes of transportation. Um, we'll also try to make as much as possible mobile. So we may have, uh, you know, because there are no roads really, I mean, there might be dirt roads in some areas, but they're very, I'm not sure you can dignify them by calling them roads, um, and they're more pathways. Um, so, we try to bu build around the transportation systems now uh, because they're, they're not existing. I guess if there's one bright side to the way the AIDS epidemic spread is that in many countries it spread along the truck routes because it was the truckers that actually, you know, uh, spread the disease. So a lot of the concentrations of people with AIDS are near highways. And, uh, but once you get off the highway you still need some system to get people. And, and it's very um, dramatic. I mean, we, I think I said in the earlier session, I mean, I was in Rwanda the week before last, and we've set up um, with Paul Farmer in a district of about 350,000 people, which is among the poorest in Rwanda. And we're setting up the community health worker system now, and we've set up the big hospital and a couple of the satellite health centers. But we've only got the community health workers deployed in about a third of the villages, because we just started seven months ago. But we'll have it in all the villages within the next three or four months. But I saw a woman there um, uh, when I got to the clinic this time who was just unconsolably crying and, and I asked what the story was and she had just walked 14 kilometers with her uh, two-year-old on her back uh, because he was not well. And it was something where if we had had the community health worker in place, uh, they would have seen that he was suffering from malnutrition, her baby, and we could have done something about it out in the community. But she walked 14 kilometers, and by the time he got to the health center, the baby was already dead. The baby had died on the walk, and so there's nothing they could do. And uh, it's to your point. I mean, I think the, the initial thing is, is to get the community health worker network going, and then to get them the ability to move around so that they can see all the families, so that a family in the village or the next village knows that if their baby's not doing well or whatever's happening, they can get to somebody. And the community health worker's not going to know how to treat them, Definitely, but there are certain things you can train them to sort of say, if you see these signs, it means they need some clean water, boil the water, do this. If you see these signs, they're going to need some, they need some food, it's nutrition, and it can't be just the starch, it's got to be some, and then get them here, you know, to the health satellite as soon as possible before they lapse into coma or before, you know, and in the case like malnutrition or the clean water stuff or diarrheal stuff, a matter of hours can make a difference. And so identifying the problem early, you can save a lot of lives, or with drug side effects and AIDS or whatever. So uh, it's partly transportation and it's partly the, the network of people that are trained. And, uh, and what's so brilliant about Paul Farmer's model is that, you know, paying all these local community health workers uh, also brings some money into the villages. And it's a rounding error on the total cost of the program, you know, because the amounts you're paying are so small relative to the cost of the drugs or the cost of the tests or whatever, even at the reduced prices we have. Yeah, um, yes, ma'am. I think there's a lot of students here. Um, my question goes back to something that you had said earlier about addressing the AIDS crisis before, you know, before any other policy issues could even be addressed. Yeah. And uh, going with that, 
knowing that there are so many different facets to each and every problem right. that, that we deal with, to expanding new initiatives such as um, the childhood obesity or climate change, how do you begin to identify which facets are most accessible to begin addressing right. the taxes? So in the, um, in the context of global poverty, which is what we started on with AIDS as being a sort of first step we had to take, we're now, uh, there's a man named Tom Hunter who's given $100 million to the foundation over 10 years to try to take the, um, the next step, which we're going to start to do in three countries, where we're going to build off the rural initiative we have in Rwanda, Malawi, and one other country. And we're going to expand it to clean water and sanitation and into agricultural development, uh, kind of a green revolution for Africa, um, to try to deal with food security issues as well as to begin to provide, because like in a place like Rwanda, 80% of the people are, are, are farmers, 45, 50% of the GNP is agriculture. And the productivity rates are very low in agriculture. Uh, but with some reasonably simple steps, you can get the productivity up dramatically. So we're going to expand our global poverty effort in that direction towards agricultural development, clean water, and sanitation. And that also will be the precondition for beginning an effort with respect to education. Because if you visit uh, schools in most of Africa or in uh, southern Asia, what you find is, number one, a lot of kids don't go to school. And the main issue is because they've got to be working out in the field. If you provide a school program that has food, a lunch program, and a breakfast program at the school, attendance will double or triple at the school because the kids can get fed at school. And if you provide clean water and sanitation along with the food, then the kids are no longer going to school sick, which is typically what you find. A lot of kids are sick every day. And you can't learn if you're sick. And so those are the preconditions to having an education system that's going to work. I mean, I, I've gone into schools. I use this in an ironic way, but I've gone into schools in Africa where, you know, somebody with a good heart and in the computer business decided to give a bunch of computers to the school. And the computers are just sitting there and you go to the school and you kind of, you know, the, the kids can barely, you know, they're throwing up all day. I mean, they're not going to learn how to use computers. And none of the teachers know how to use them anyway and they just sort of sit there. Uh, there are basic things you've got to do uh, to, to, to get education ready and so on. So. We're expanding overall our global poverty effort in that way to kind of expand out from health to clean water and sanitation and to agricultural development. Climate change is a different initiative uh, to address something which uh, is potentially catastrophic. It's not a question of whether it's going to happen. It's a question of when it's going to happen. Uh, and if we don't start addressing it uh, in a much more serious way in the world, you know, and some number of years, whether it's 20 or 50 or 100. You know, New York and Boston are going to be under 30 feet of water, and there's going to be massive droughts around the world. And, so. and the scientific evidence is overwhelming about that now. Uh, and it's also uh, reasonably certain that the greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere are responsible for a good part of that. And, uh, and we've got to do something about reducing them, or else, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, there's going to be a catastrophe that we've not experienced in, you know, since the last ice age, if not before that. So, uh, and right now the world's heading, you know, still in the opposite direction, and the governments are not able to pull something together now that's going to work. So we're looking at what we can do to make a difference, and uh, so that's a separate initiative, but one that obviously is important. And then we wanted the ma a major domestic initiative, and this one dealing with the. Childhood obesity, it's a little bit more than obesity because, you know, I mean, my kids are thin, but they still eat too much crap and uh, probably their arteries are, you know, jamming up. And, uh, you know, it's been tragic. I mean, some of the kids that have come home from Iraq where they've done autopsies, you know, 20, 21 year olds, have arteries like 7 year olds because of what they've been eating. And, uh, you know, adult onset diabetes in children now is going up astronomically. Um, so, we took that on because it was, you know, what we viewed as perhaps the major health issue that we could impact from the private side. You know, we're not going to be able to reform the American healthcare system. We couldn't do it in the government. We're not going to be able to do it from the private side, but we can do something about this issue, we think. And so we took it on. So I guess the, the best way to answer your question is that, you know, we want to do stuff that's 
very significant for the world where we can be successful and make a difference with the time that we have left. Yes. What role you see for a private foundation in um, doing a climate change initiative? It seems to me there's two ways to address the problem. Um, probably both need to be done. You can change producer behavior. You can change consumer behavior. Um, what approach do you see for the Clinton Foundation? To take? We're, you know, before we started the age initiative, age initiative, we spent a couple of months researching and deciding where we could make the biggest difference, and we did the same thing on the childhood obesity issue uh, where we're partnering with the American Heart Association. So we're in the process of, do, of doing that now, of studying that. We've been approached by, by all kinds of leaders around the world and people involved in this movement to get involved. And we're in the process of having discussions now with a lot of people trying to figure it out. But I'll give you an example of something that might be possible that parallels what we did in the AIDS world. Um, if you look right now at the uh, equation of what's happening with greenhouse gases, there are four major pieces. Uh, electricity generation, where we're using primarily coal still, and to a lesser extent oil and natural gas, that are spewing forth a lot of greenhouse gases when we create electricity. The second is transportation, where we use mainly oil, gasoline, to fuel our cars and our trucks and so on, which are also greenhouse gases. A third issue is that we're very inefficient in the use of our energy. You know, the appliances we use, the light bulbs we use, and so on, use more energy than they need to. Uh, and so those could be made more energy efficient. And the fourth is, at the same time that we're putting more greenhouse gases into the air, more carbon dioxide into the air, we're destroying the natural system that exists in the world to take carbon dioxide out of the air, which is trees and plankton in the ocean and plants, because we're cutting down you know, massive amounts of forests in Brazil and Indonesia and other parts of the world, we have the tropical forests that take carbon dioxide out of the air and put oxygen up, right? your basic science. And so we're hitting the world in two ways at once. And the result is you know, the ice caps are melting in Greenland and the, and the temperature of the earth and our atmosphere is the warmest it's been in two million years. Uh, and it's, um, uh, well, you know, the figures. So, um, Let's take just one piece of that, but it's true for all four pieces. Let's look at the electricity generation. So there are technologies now uh, that are still early in their development. Uh, for example, coal gasification, where you can still use the coal, which we have in abundance. But what you do is you capture the greenhouse gases that would come off into, uh, you know, instead of putting them up into the air, you capture them. And then there are two different uh, possibilities. One is you bury them underground, which they're doing in a project in Norway, for example, uh, and just store them underground. Um, the second is that you do various chemical reactions on them, which turn them into harmless byproducts. So you basic, uh, basically um, you know, can turn them into effectively sand or some other things that are then in solid form that are clean and that you can just empty out through a series or water or other things. Now, right now, the coal gasification technologies, there are maybe, you know, five, ten plants around the world um, with that. And so as a result, it's far more expensive than just setting up a normal coal plant. Uh, similarly, we have solar energy, which is low efficiency, still small scale photovoltaics that can be used to generate electricity, take up a lot of space. We have wind, uh, which also is small scale, high cost. And the cost right now, of each of those things is much higher than just using coal. Now, so therefore the people that are building plants to generate electricity say, well, I can't, you know, I can't afford that extra amount of money. In Europe, some of the governments provide incentives. They say, okay, if you'll use wind power, Mr. Power Generator, I'll you know, give you tax incentives, or I'll do whatever, and that works to some extent, but not enough. So here's what we're you know, thinking about, for example. Um, we're studying the economics of, let's say, coal gasification, much as we did with the drugs. And we're saying, okay, if I could guarantee that there are going to be 100 or 300 or 400 coal gasification plants ordered in the next five or 10 years, 
uh, and therefore we could produce the different component parts much more economically. We'd have a predictable market. We could advance the technology. We could do various things. We'd help that come down its cost curve to be much closer to traditional coal-fired plants. And maybe the gap would only be 10% in capital cost instead of what it is now, which is double or triple. Okay. Then we say, OK, um, in order to build 100 or 200 of these, or 300 or 400, we know who's going to be buying these plants. So we go to the buyers, and we say, what kind of differential would you be willing to take under what circumstances? Let's assume they say none. It's got to be the same price, or maybe 5% premium, but no more than that or whatever. Then we can go to the financial community and say, OK, we're going to need a trillion dollars over the next 10 years to be invested in coal gasification plants, or two trillion, wherever to build them. That's the cost. Um, but they're going to start at high cost, and therefore, you know, uh, what kind of incentives do we need that could make you finance these, OK, and get over the hump? Then we go to some of the governments and say, OK, if we don't deal with global warming, you're going to spend far more money on Katrina-like events and other things. So it's better now to give a couple of small tax incentives or other kinds of incentives to get the cost of the first 50 or 100 of these down the cost curve, because once we've done that, you won't need to give much of a subsidy, right? Because it'll be a much lower cost to produce. And we can try to knit somebody together where you're not saying to a Goldman Sachs or to a JP Morgan, we want you to put money into some big fund. What you're saying to them is we want you to commit you know, $5 billion a year of what you're investing to alternate energy stuff. And you decide which projects you want to fund. So there's going to be 300 of these plants built. You know, you like the one in China, build the one in China. You want one in India, build one. You know, that's up to you what you finance. But we want you to commit that you're going to put $5 billion a year into this alternate energy fund. The governments are going to set up a regime that provides these incentives. So we're going to get you, you know, a reasonable return for it, and so on. And so you basically convening, and then we go to the buyers and say, and then the producers, and say, OK, we're going to have a guaranteed market. We want you moving down your cost curve. We want you to forward price by a couple of years, like we do with the drug manufacturer. Okay. What can a private foundation do? Probably nothing. What can a private foundation run by President Clinton do? Uh, that's different. Because President Clinton's phone calls get taken. Right? And President Clinton can basically be a convener where he can get, potentially, if we have a good plan, he could get 5 or 10 or 15 of the major financial houses to say, well, if you can really do that, if you can really get the purchasers to say they'll do it, if you can get the governments to give these kinds of incentives, yeah, we'll put up the money. And then he can go to the governance at the G8 and say, look, for these kinds of incentives, here's why this makes sense to you. I think the financial guys will come along if you provide these kinds of incentives. Then he can go to the purchasers and say, look, this isn't going to cost you much of a premium to do. Uh, and the financial guys will back you, and the, you know, the governments are going to be. And he can try to knit this together in a way that nobody else on the planet can do. Now, right now, that's a pie in the sky idea, but it's, it's one we're trying to look at very carefully and see whether we can refine it down, get enough buy in from different people. Uh, right now, there are these carbon exchanges that already exist under the Kyoto Protocols where there are incentives already available, um, and we feed those in and so on. And we're seeing if we can knit together a plan that would jumpstart this. And we're doing the same thing in different ways on the other issues. But right now, it's all research. And we're doing this research over the next couple of months. If I can put together with the teams we have, and we have some of the best financial minds in the world working with us on this, and if we can knit together something that's got a shot at working, then we may go in and try to do it, try to be a convener and try to put it together and, and see if we can do it. Um, but. You know, the, the, when we started the AIDS deal, I mean, that may sound, oh, boy, that's complicated. That's what We started with the AIDS deal. Um, and I said this to President Clinton. I said, you know, uh, he said, well, who have you checked this with? And I said, OK, I've checked it with these heads of state, and none of them think we can succeed. <laughs> so I told him that straight out. And I said, but let's look at what failure means. So if instead of getting a couple of million people on treatment, we, get, we save 50,000 lives, is that failure? You know, that's not bad. Um, so, and if we don't do it, nobody else is going to step out and do it. So I, I, think, I feel the same way in the climate change thing. You know, the thing I just described, you know, to potentially completely move the balance on electric generation, well, maybe we don't get there, but maybe we get a couple of financial people together and maybe we get, you know, 
20 plants built differently or 30 plants built differently. Well, that's something anyway. So that's the kind of thing we're working on. It's probably a longer answer than you wanted. But, uh, but I think what drives us most, uh, well, let me speak for myself. I don't want to speak for President Clinton. What drives me most is just like with the AIDS thing. I mean, we know what happens if we don't act on AIDS. People die every day. So I'd rather try to act, make mistakes, uh, fail at some things, uh, go down a blind alley and come back down and try to go up another place and at least be trying to do something instead of just sitting back and watching all those people die. And the same thing on climate change. We know it and the science is in. We know what's going to happen to our Earth. And we've got this very fragile layer of atmosphere sitting between us and nothing. And we're poisoning. We are poisoning that fragile layer. And our kids or grandkids are going to be the the people who suffer from that, and they're going to turn back and say, what did you do, Daddy? What did you do? You know, Grandma, to deal with that. And if you say, oh, well, it was too complicated, or, you know, people said we wouldn't get anywhere, that's no excuse. So I think where we are is, you know, we want to take these hard issues, and we want to use who President Clinton is to say, well, hell, if it was easy, we wouldn't have to involve him in doing it. Somebody else can do it, right? So we're going to take the hard stuff, and we're going to try to make a difference with it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, thank oh, you, Howard, so. and we uh, get you off to the airport yeah. here. So. But anyway, we'd welcome uh, you know you all to work with us as interns, and then eventually uh, to work with us if you if you're so inclined. So uh, uh, please be in touch. And I think we've had some discussions about that earlier today yeah. about the internships, and we'd be delighted to have. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I love her. Oh, you're on the right. She misses you. Yeah, I miss her too.